All right. Back to Job. Back to the book of Job. Now, after uh, Job breaks that, you remember after the situation where his friends come, and there's that week-long silence. And Job breaks that silence in chapter 3 by complaining bitterly about his situation. And after that, his friends, they feel compelled to respond. So you have Eliphaz speaks, Job. Bildad speaks, Job. And then in chapter 11, Zophar speaks. And he says that God is unimaginably great and understands all things including the truth about people's iniquity. And according to Zophar, if the truth be known, that that God is is exacting from Job less than his guilt deserves. And in line with Eliphaz and Bildad, Zophar says the problem really is Job's foolish resistance to enlightenment. If he just acknowledge his sin and repent of it, God would restore him to a blessed state. But if he won't, then there's no way of escape. All hope of escape is lost if he won't repent. And then Job responds to Zophar in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And he says the issue isn't God's power and knowledge, but the fact that he, Job, is a just and righteous man, but God's nevertheless punishing him like a like a tremendous sinner and as support for his claim that God is willing to punish the innocent, he cites the flip side of the injustice coin, the fact God is willing to bless the sinful, that he's willing to give peace to robbers and security to idolaters. And then he says in in 13 verses 6 to 12, He asks if they'll lie for God, if if his three friends, if they're willing to lie for God, if, if they'll act as unscrupulous advocates who twist the truth into God's favor. And he warns them that God knows the truth. And he won't be pleased with their partiality. They're twisting the truth like that. Their unfair assessment of Job's situation. He says God will rebuke them for what they're doing and that his dread will fall on them. And that happens in chapter 42, verse 7. And then he says in verse 12 that their words have no substance. And we move into 13 to 19, which is where we ended it at 12 last or two weeks ago. And then 13 to 19, Tremper Longman, he summarizes the gist of those verses this way. He says, Job expresses his determination to press his case against God, even though he thinks his chances are slight or even nil. Nevertheless, he wants to go in and confront God's treatment of him in light of his innocent and blameless behavior. And we see in verse 14 of chapter 13, these two proverbial expressions there. They're obscure, but it seems clear that they mean to put something valuable at risk. That seems to be the meaning of these, uh, of these uh, proverbial expressions. That's clearly the meaning of putting one's life in one's hand. You can see that in other places. That, that means to put something valuable at risk. So presumably that's also the meaning of the former. Putting flesh in teeth is to put at risk uh, is to put that flesh at risk of being consumed. So I think that you see when I put brackets here, that means that I've modified the English Standard Version. The default I'm using is the English Standard Version, but sometimes I put it in brackets to modify that. So I, I think that's what he's talking about. Is It means to put something valuable at risk. And the translation of chapter 13, verse 15, it's notoriously difficult, and the scholarly renderings of that verse vary quite widely, but what seems to fit the context is something like I have here. Though he slay me, I have no other hope. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways to his face or I will defend my ways before him. See, Job believes God may well reject his case despite his innocence. Job knows he's innocent. He wants to confront God 
to put God to the proof. But he believes God may well reject his case despite his innocence because he's convic- convinced that God is quite capable of punishing the righteous. But he's nevertheless resigned to proceed because he's currently being absolutely crushed. He's being absolutely crushed and presenting his case before God seems to him to be the, to be the only option. You know, that's the, he's just getting steamrolled and devastated. So he says, look, you know, I basically don't really have any other options. Now, from Job's current perspective of God, a perspective that's born of prolonged physical suffering, going before God with an accusation of wrongdoing, this is this thing about putting something valuable at risk, when he says, I want to go and confront God with this case, Doing that, see, putting going before God with an accusation of wrongdoing, given Job's current perspective of God, it carries an anxiety. You see, beyond what the lowliest of subjects would have felt in going before a king like Nebuchadnezzar with a charge of wrongdoing. You see, only somebody desperate, only somebody desperate would even contemplate doing such a thing. You see, so that's, that, that's a measure of his desperation, how difficult, how much he's suffering. That he says, look, it's just I'm taking my life in my hands, but I got to do something. That's what I want. And verse 13, Job 13, 16, Job seems to be saying that whatever should happen, if he's able to force this confrontation with God, whatever should happen, His appearing before God, just the fact of his appearing before God will be his victory. It will be his deliverance from scorn in the sense it will prove his claim of being righteous, that 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 his claim of being righteous was true because no godless person would dare to go in front of God. You see, so the very fact, even if he smokes me, The very fact I'm willing to go before him will be proof that I am in fact righteous because no godless person would dare to do that. That's what I think Job is saying in 1316. And that fits with this loud and bold declaration you get in 1317 to 19 of his determination to press forward with this pursuing God to present his case there. Then in 1320 to 28, He addresses God directly and he tells them that he will be able to interact with him. He'll be able to present his case before God if God will stop harming and scaring him. You see, in in that event, if he's if he'll stop that so Job can present his case to him. In that case, Job will demand an accounting of his sins that justify his suffering. He's going to go in and say, listen. You're punishing me, though I'm righteous. Now pony up. You show me the sins that, that, you know, that justify what you're doing to me. And, you know, he's going to seek an explanation of why God's treating him as an enemy. And he suggests there in 20 to 28 that it's beneath God to frighten one as frail and weakened as he is. And, and then, And then he represents the kind of pain that God is inflicting on him by referring to incarceration and the restricting of his movement by cutting his feet. Now, that cutting his feet is not reflected in the ESV, and I didn't sub that in. But this is something, what he's talking about there, he's representing the kind of pain that God is inflicting on him. And in verse 28, it reflects Job's sense of wasting away at the hands of God, which Job generalizes to mankind. And then in 14, 1 to 6, Job says, look, human life, it's brief and it's full of hardship. And then after emphasizing the brevity of human life, he complains generally that God scrutinizes human lives so closely and specifically that God condemns him. 
such focus and attention, it seems to be out of keeping with the insignificance of mankind's fleeting life. Why is God so obsessed? Focusing and watching just every move so that he winds up, you see, condemning him. He says, no man can free himself of all sin. You see, no man can bring a completely clean life from an unclean nature. But where's the justice in zeroing in on the failings of the relatively righteous? That's Job. Where's the justice in zeroing in on the failings of somebody like Job for the purpose of punishment while allowing the wicked to escape unscathed? Yes, nobody's going to come out of this thing perfectly clean from an unclean nature. But Job's question is, why are you treating me this way? You see, I'm a righteous guy. I'm a pious man. No phoniness. And yet I'm absolutely getting killed. Now, given the brevity of human life, Job calls for God to cease this punishing scrutiny that mankind, and particularly Job, so that they at least might find the joy comparable to that of a hired laborer. Will you take your focus off in this punishing interest in me and mankind so that at least we can find the kind of you know, joy that's comparable to a hired laborer may, so that mankind may experience only the normal hardships of life? rather than the extraordinary affliction of God's select punishment? You know, won't you do that? And the point of, of 14, 7 to 12, is that it giving man some peace in this brief life, it's all the more important. Because unlike a felled tree that he talks about there, Death to Job, it's not a mere state of dormancy. It's not a mere state of dormancy from which one emerges to live again. See, Job seems to understand death as a permanent condition. He seems to look at death as a permanent condition to believe that this, this life is all there is. His statement in verse 12 that the dead man will not awaken, he says, until the heavens are no more. Now, that's pos that possibly means, it could be taken to mean that death will only be reversed at some unknown future point beyond history. You see, a time of such radical transformation that the entire cosmos ceases to exist in its present state and I think that kind of thing is happening. But the context of Job's statement, the context, in my view and in the view of many commentators, it seems to favor uh, the view that until the heavens are no more, that that's an idiom of permanence. Something like our idiom until hell freezes over. You see, it seems to be an idiom of permanence. In other words, Job is bolstering his appeal for God to give man some peace in this short life because when it's over, it's over. You see, that seems to be what Job is saying. Now, Job's lack of awareness, if that's the right take, Job's lack of awareness of the resurrection is not shocking, given the likely pre-patriarchal setting of the story. You remember, this is before Abraham. And God, the truth about the resurrection, is revealed by God progressively. It is revealed by God over time. I mean, Job clearly is incorrect and uninformed about other things, he says. So his ignorance on this point's not unique. And as I said a couple weeks ago, the normative message of the book of Job. The normative message of the inspired book is not everything that Job and his friends utter, right? You can parachute into Job 
and just pull out a statement by one of his friends or something and say, the Bible says. But if you don't understand the context of the book, you're missing the point. These people are rebuked at the end. You see? So if you don't know that what's happening in the book, you can't just pull that out and say this is divine truth. And so the fact Job, if this is correct, if he's ignorant of the resurrection, that's not saying God says there's no resurrection. It's just a reflection of one of the things about which Job is ignorant. So like I say, the normative message of the book isn't the thing, everything that Job and his friends utter but it's the perspective that God brings to their entire dialogue at the end. When God comes and speaks at the end, now you look through that. And that's how you understand what is God communicating through the book of Job. You see, you can't just go at it piecemeal or you, I think you'll wind up in a theological quagmire. But uh, in 14, 13 to 17... He says, look, though, though he believes death is permanent, if I'm reading that correctly, though he believes death is permanent, he says in 14, 13 to 17, that he would relish the prospect of God's taking his life, hiding him in Sheol. He would relish the prospect of that in the sense he there would be away from God's punishing attention. This attention that he says God is just under a microscope. He's got you there. Watching every move, every thought, everything. And so he says, look, he would welcome this respite of God hiding him in Sheol, in the realm of the dead. You see, where he would be free from that punishing attention and then restoring his life after God's wrath against him had passed. He'd welcome that. If you put me in hibernation, in Sheol, burn off all this wrath, just let me sit tight over there, and then brought me back, that'd be cool. You see, I would welcome that. I think verse 16 is best rendered as it is in the New English translation. There are a couple others, Revised English Bible, New Jerusalem Bible, uh, are similar. But I think it's best rendered as I have it there. Surely now you count my steps, then... You would not mark my sin. You see, the meaning being that this, this critical scrutiny to which God is now subjecting his life would not exist on his imagined return from Sheol after God's wrath had passed. In other words, after he'd been put on ice, God spends his wrath, brings him back. You see, so he's saying here, when he says, then you would not mark my sin in this imaginary hoped for situation that Job has. But in verse 17, he further describes that different perspective toward him that he would welcome from God, where he says, and my transgression would be sealed up in a bag and you would cover over my iniquity. This is what he would hope for. Okay, what Job would want. And as Longman says, <clears throat> Job, quote, continues his wish for a future in which God overlooks his sins rather than being so precise in his attention to them. That's what Job is feeling. He's just feeling that, man, you know, you're just scrutinizing me at every turn and beating me to death. Can't you just give me a break, put me off somewhere, get through this and bring me back and forget all that? That's what he would like. Then he says in 18 to 22 of chapter 14, <clears throat> He moved from his wish, his wish that God would put him in temporary hibernation in Sheol until his anger had passed. He moves from that wish to the reality of what he's experiencing. As natural forces, he says, as natural forces grind down a mountain, God, in Job's perspective, grinds down human hope by afflicting them. You see, changing a man's countenance from joyful hope to fear and anxiety and depression. And he then sends them to Sheol. So Job's view of how God is working now, he takes this joyful countenance, grinds the person into the dirt, and then sends him to death. That's how Job. Now you look at that and say, how can Job be a spiritual? I keep telling you, you have to put yourself in Job's shoes 
of having suffered to the point his skin's about falling off and he's scraping. And this goes on and on and on and on. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> As a righteous man and having this theology that doesn't allow him to deal with this. So I just want you to always remember what, what Job is experiencing and what he's talking about. So here he says there that, see, these, as natural forces, they grind this down. While, they, while people, they suffer at the end there, he says, look, they, they suffer while they suffer with whatever debilitating condition characterizes the ends of their lives. They're so focused on their own suffering that they're not even aware of their children's lives. And I think that's pretty powerful. He says, his sons come to honor in 21, and he doesn't know it. And you see, a parent, when a parent is suffering so much that he's clueless to what's happening to his children, you know that parent is focused inward. And that's the point. He's talking here about the situation of life as he sees it in this now... Uh, you know, just bent perspective of his prolonged suffering. Tremper Longman talks about the, his comment on the human condition I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> he says, so why is life short and hard? The answer comes in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve rebel against God. They replace God's sovereignty with their own. By eating the fruit of the forbidden tree, they try to define their own moral standards and not allow God to do so. You see, that's the, that's the event. It is a usurping of God's right to judge. I want to sit on the throne and determine. So that's what's wrapped up in that. And he says the consequence is death and suffering. Humans are alienated from God and from each other, from creation and even from themselves. So why do humans experience suffering? Because of sin. Now I'm beginning to sound like one of the three friends. Job is suffering because of sin. However, I have repeatedly emphasized in this commentary and will do so till the end. The book of Job makes very clear that Job is innocent and virtuous, fearing God and turning away from sin, one, one, and elsewhere. We lose our way in the book of Job if we ever forget that Job is not personally responsible for his suffering. On the other hand, there would be no suffering in death apart from sin, right? Romans 5, 12 to 21. What the story of Job undermines is the belief that all of our suffering and pain and our death are the direct result of our own personal sin. It keeps us from looking at someone who is sick, poor, or depressed and asking, what they do to deserve this? The book, though, is not denying that it is human rebellion that has marred life and brought death into the world. Okay, so certainly, sin is what opened the door to the virus. You know, it op this virus comes in and it has polluted everything. We live in a fallen world because of sin. But to look at somebody's suffering and say, that is because you are an extraordinary sinner. That's why you're suffering the way you do. You are suffering out of the bell curve. Everybody has a certain amount of suffering, but you're way out over here. And out over here, that's because you're an exceptional sinner. That's what they think. And that's why they're beating Job to death with it. And Job shares their theology, but he knows he's not a sinner like that. So that leads Job then to say, you're breaking the deal, God. You're, you're, you're treating me unright. You're being unjust in doing this. Now, chapter 15, you, that's the first cycle of speeches. You may be moaning now going, there are two more of these? But as I told you, see, what happens is part of the thing is there, there, it does become almost tedious, but that's part of the message. And part of the message is, is that where does true wisdom lie? And you and I see in this particular instance of the extraordinary suffering of Job, we are privy as readers that God is doing something else because God has revealed that to us in this particular instance. 
There are other occasions of suffering where God doesn't reveal it to us. And from the people in this book, they're not privy to what we're privy to. And so they're looking and they're searching. They're exercising wisdom trying to find. And they claim they have the answer. But we know they don't. And so part of the message is how human wisdom continues to grope without reaching the right conclusion, the point being that true wisdom is with God. And there are things that you will not come to unless God reveals it to you. Okay, so that's, that plays into it. The Spirit knows what he's doing. Now, in the second, the second uh, cycle of dialogues or speeches... Eliphaz opens up in chapter 15, and he says in verses 1 to 6, he opens his second speech by insulting Job as being full of hot air and rebuking him for speaking without proper reverence toward God. And then in verses 7 to 10, he charges Job with being arrogant, acting like he has a special pipeline to God and acting like he knows more than everybody, including the prior generations. Now, in our world, prior generations are looked at as stupid. See, what do they know? That's not the biblical world. In the biblical world, prior generations are a, uh, a bed of wisdom. You see, you look back to, to older people, prior generations, and they knew what was going on. And so he's saying to Job, listen, man, you're, you're arrogant. You think you know more than everybody, including the prior generations. And then Eliphaz, in 11 to 16, he chides Job for rejecting the comforts or consolations of God given to him, presumably given to him through Eliphaz's first speech, specifically in the message Eliphaz had been given by a spirit that all humans are guilty of sin. You remember that in chapter 4, verses 7 to 12? Eliphaz sees his message, that message that all humans are guilty of sin that was given to him by a spirit. He sees that message as comforting and gentle in that it supports the notion that Job is being punished for his sin. You see, by implication from the fact that Job, like all humans, is a sinner. So it's saying to Job, you're being punished for your sin and thus it points to the, the solution to his plight. It carries the solution to his plight in the form of repentance. He asks why Job's angry and driven to speak against God rather than acknowledge his sin given the corruption and the injustice that characterize mankind generally. You see, what's up with that? You know, why, why don't you just acknowledge yourself? Why be so adamant? Why be so adamant in your claim of innocence in the face of humanity's track record, especially when the result of that is to wind up accusing God of injustice? Why don't you just fast? You see, why don't you just come clean? And then at 15, 17 to 24... He appeals to his personal observations and the wisdom of their forefathers in asserting that it is the wicked who suffers. He says, I've lived, I've looked, I've seen. It's the wisdom who suffer, and the forefathers knew that too. And so he appeals to those things in this enigmatic statement in 19b there that no stranger passed in the midst of the forefathers. That's probably a way of suggesting that they were so insightful that no one was a stranger in the sense that no one was unknown by them. They quickly could discern the truth about everyone, just a way of magnifying the prior generations who happened to agree with him that the wicked suffer. You see, so he says, look, I've seen it, I've watched it, I've observed it, I know the fact. Wisdom through my observations, the wicked suffer Prior generations are down with that. It's the wicked who suffer. You see, so that's, that's the thing that, uh, uh, you know, they understood that and they're so exalted that they could discern the truth about everyone. Then he says in 1525 to 35, he declares that the wicked will suffer because they defy God 
And then he elaborates on the horrors that the wicked will experience. He's trying to drive Job to repentance. From his perspective, that's what he he thinks the solution lies there. And he's trying to, he lays out all these horrors, trying to drive Job to repentance because he views Job as exhibit A. You're the perfect, you're the guy I'm talking about. The wicked suffer, you're getting blasted like nobody I've ever seen. And so you need to recognize that. See, in Eliphaz's eyes, Job is suffering so horribly precisely because he's wicked. Now, you and I know that's not true. But yet this guy's just telling Job that, just pouring it out, this wise man. He's telling Job that's what's going on. See, Eliphaz, he was so fixed in his mistaken theology that nothing he witnessed in life and no protestations of innocence would make a dent. He's like this dude. You see, everybody else, Job said, even the bushes can look around and see that the wicked prosper and the idolaters are secure. Not always. But there are examples of that. Not this dude. Wicked suffer. That's it. So he can't, you know, he's going around with his blinders. See, wherever he saw abnormal suffering, whenever he saw that, he knew. He just knew it was God's punishment for sinfulness. So all contrary indications, they were simply dismissed summarily. I already know the answer. And so you say, but listen, Job says, I have a long track record of being righteous, and I'm telling you, right to your face, up front, I'm a righteous, pious, devout man. You can look around and see. You see? It's like he he just simply will not acknowledge it, will not, he's he's closed. Now Longman, Tremper Longman, he contrasts this with the psalmist in Psalm 73. He too, the psalmist, accepted retribution through theology, but he was at least willing to acknowledge what he saw. He was at least willing to acknowledge what he saw, that the wicked do indeed seem to prosper in this life. You don't have to be extremely perceptive to see that. And this threw the psalmist into confusion which caused him almost to stumble, he says. In Psalm 72, 73, 2 and 3. But he was driven by that to an encounter with God in which he came to a deeper understanding of God's retribution for sin. Here's what Longman says. He says, the psalmist, in Psalm 73, came to understand that there are not perfect and immediate consequences for sin. There is not this absolutist retribution theology and righteousness in the present, but in the end, it all washes out. In the end, everyone gets what they deserve. Now, Longman is, of course, not denying that salvation is by grace, but he's saying only that those who are faithful to God and thus because of that, inevitably, necessarily live righteously, they will one day be perfectly distinguished from those who are not faithful to God and thus live unrighteously. Now Job, then Job responds or speaks next in chapter 16, in verses 1 to 6. He begins his next speech by insulting his friends. You see, I said, these guys are wisdom teachers, and this is what they do. They put down one another as like, you know, I really have insight. Your stuff's stupid. Okay? So they, you know, Job's not alone in this. They do that to him. You know, you're hot air, you're this and that. So Job opens up here. He insults his friends for their trite responses that fail to comfort and lack insight. They give only windy words. That's not a compliment. They give only windy words. See, if their situations were reversed, 
Job says he could easily berate them. He could do that. He could easily berate them and view them with contempt. But he claims he would instead strengthen and comfort them. That's how he'd respond to the situation. And since his pain remains, whether he speaks or whether he stays silent, he might as well keep talking. He says, could being silent's not doing anything to help me. So I might as well keep talking. Then he says in 16, 7 to 14, he gives his, per- his perception of God's attitude toward and God's assault upon him. God hates him. Now, I wonder if any of you have ever felt that way. God hates him. That's Job's perception. And he's come after him, as we would put it, hammer and tong. He's come after him hammer and tong. See, which suffering indicates to others that Job is an extraordinary sinner. One who deserves such punishment. That's what others see. When they see Job in this condition, they all simply know Job is a closet sinner. He's a pious phony. Job, oh, he looked good. Everybody talked about Job. He looked good. But now we know that Job was a phony. So he's just disgraced because of this suffering that has come on him. So they despise and they attack him. Those who are less righteous than Job. They're coming up mocking him. I don't know about you, but that would would just drive me crazy. That would drive me crazy. You see, to have all these people who are living however they're living, you've been following God all along, and then have them all conclude you're a pious fraud, you're the worst of sinners, and your stuff's double because you, you hit it behind a pious facade. That's how they look at him. He says in 15, 16, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he describes his mourning and his grief over their harsh treatment. In verse 17, he again makes clear that his suffering's undeserved. There's no violence in his hands and his prayer is pure. Job is the real deal. His stuff is bona fide. And you see that all over. In verse 18, he appeals for his cry for justice. Not to be silenced or exhausted. He doesn't want his cry for justice to just die out. That's the first bell, right? Just to... He doesn't want that to happen, you see. He wants it not to be silenced, not to grow weary, not to be exhausted. And following David Klein's translation of some very difficult Hebrew. He says in chapter 16, verses 19 to 21, that the claims he's made in this dialogue, his protestations of innocence, those claims are even now standing as his witness in heaven, serving as an advocate of his righteousness. It's like in a court case where you've given sworn testimony in a deposition, and that's now on file. It sits in the court file. And that's how he's saying his protestations and declarations that I am innocent. Everybody, sinner, sinner, confess, confess, repent, repent. I'm innocent. I'm not that person. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. No! And he says these declarations now stand. They're of record standing in heaven as as a representation of my innocence. They stand up there as an advocate of my righteousness. Though that's a poor substitute for a personal confrontation with God. That's what he wants. He wants to come before God and say, I'm innocent Justify what you're doing to me. That's what he wants. That's a poor substitute. He says the truth about it, as Klein says, the truth about his innocence has been placed on record in the heavenly court. I think that's the right take on that. And against hope, 
He sleeplessly awaits a fair hearing of his case. Now, he'll be dead in a few years at most, he says in 1622. But the cry for justice, the plea of his righteousness and innocence that he set forth, that shall stand. And then he says in 17, 1 and 2, he says he's broken and near death. And he's being provoked by the mockers who surround him. Now, this is a sad thing for Job. I mean, you just think of this guy who's getting this hammer, doesn't understand why, knows he's pious, and his buddies are killing him. Now, you see their perspective. They have swallowed completely this absolutist retribution theology. So for them, it's like one and one equals two. You see? And so they're, they're winding up killing him. And in 17, 3 and 4, he calls on God. He calls on God to vouch for his innocence, to put up a pledge on his behalf, because it was God who eliminated all of his human supporters, who turned all of his human supporters into mockers by blinding their minds to his innocence by punishing him so severely. When God punishes him so severely, everybody sits here and says, yeah, Job's great, Job's great, Job's great. All this happens to Job, and everybody goes, uh-oh, Job's not great. So he's saying, to, he's saying, listen, he wants God here. So he says he calls on him to vouch for his innocence, to put up this pledge on his behalf, because he's the one who has taken away all of Job's human supporters you see and it's a way of complaining about what God has done it's like saying God owes him for having mistreated him that's why he says I want you to pony up and the last clause of verse 4 is perhaps best translated as you will not be exalted following David Kleins and Hartley and Samuel Ballantyne and some others I heard that bell let me finish this last thing you see, that, 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 that part there is best translated, I think, as you will not be exalted. That being Job's claim that God will not be exalted for having so blinded people's minds to his innocence. He'll not be exalted for that because in Job's current state of mind, God's wrong to do it. So, of course, he won't be exalted for having done wrong. Thanks for coming.